Hello everyone, welcome to the second in our little webinar series about Cumbria's sustainable seafood. This one we're going to be focusing on what kind of species we have in the Irish Sea, um, how they're sustainably fished and how we're going to, well, how you can have a go at cooking them yourselves. We're still waiting for a few people to join. So Beth and I are just going to turn our cameras off for a moment. We'll give it a couple more minutes and just wait for everyone to get loaded into the room and then we'll kick off. So I think people are mostly here now. I know a couple of people have said they're just waiting for a response, but I'm assuming that's a response from me and Beth. So I think we're just about at full capacity. So I will turn our cameras on again and we can start. Um, welcome to the talk. As I said earlier, this is by Cumbria Wildlife Trust and we're talking about Cumbria's sustainable seafood and how it can form part of a kind of eco-friendly cuisine um, as you know a classic part of Cumbrian culture. Um, throughout the talk we'll be using the chat box so if you have any questions at all you can put them in there and we'll come to them all at the end and do our very best to answer them or at least to direct you to resources where you can find out more if it's not something that we can answer. But without further ado here we go. I'll start with a little bit of an introduction. I'm Lucy I'm the project officer for My Local Catch, which is a marine awareness project based in Whitehaven and which focuses on raising awareness about sustainable fishing and sustainable seafood in West Cumbria and how that can play a role in helping to protect uh, the muddy undersea habitats and the wildlife that we have in this area. Beth, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Beth, um, I'm the Marine Futures intern for the Northwest Wildlife Trusts. So I'm working with different partners and learning loads about the um, Irish Sea. Wonderful. So Beth's helping me in this talk to monitor all your questions, help with any kind of technical issues that you're having, and just generally be a lovely, friendly face for us to have on here as well. The other person who is a little too busy to join us today, but which is absolutely 
integral to these projects is Emily, who's our senior marine conservation officer, and she leads the Cumbrian Creole project and my project, My Local Catch, and is really the kind of visionary behind all of these. So I'll start with a little intro to the two projects which are sort of jointly making up these webinars. So the first is the Cumbrian Creole project, and this is a sustainable fishing research project um, currently based in west of Walney Marine Conservation Zone and then also in other places along the west coast of Cumbria. And it's working with local fishermen to help them to develop creel fishing for Dublin Bay prawns, or as you may know them, scampi or langoustine or nephrox or Norway lobster, or in the northwest they're just called prawns. Um, they go by many names, but they're the lovely little lobsters that you'll find breaded in the pub quite often. And we're helping to develop more sustainable fishing methods for those. And then my project is My Local Catch, which is the whole community engagement side of that work. So it's helping local people to understand what species are in their area, what their local seafood is, how they can prepare it, how they can kind of access it in a way that's affordable and easy and healthy and really forms a great part of a low carbon diet. Um, and then also working with businesses, restaurants, suppliers, youth groups, all kind of different elements of the community to help raise that awareness. So why is um, it really important to think about sustainable seafood and local sustainable seafood especially? Well, in the UK, around 60 to 70% of all the seafood we eat comes from just five species. And those species are all either overfished or have kind of issues in the way they're farmed or the way they're caught. And generally there's a lot of pressure on those species specifically. And um, that obviously causes problems when we're sort of trying to take everything from one place. So cod and haddock is what you'll likely have had um, at the fish and chip shop. And they're quite often overfished. Most of the, those fish stocks um, in European waters are kind of, have a lot of pressure on them. Tuna, which a lot of you um, will have in your kind of tuna mayo sandwiches, um, again, is a lot of the stocks around the world are overfished. Many species of tuna, such as bluefin tuna, are endangered. Um, and also the methods for fishing tuna are quite often damaging and involve these sort of big super trawler nets, which get all kinds of bycatch and things in them. Salmon is a lovely fish. We all love it from our fish farms in Scotland. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of issues with um, some poorly managed fish farms um, in terms of kind of adding nutrients to the water in that area and changing the ecosystem and also for the kind of welfare of the fish in those farms. And then prawns are kind of a, a bottom dwelling species. They're generally trawled, which can be a really damaging fishing method. Um, and just like all these other species, they're just generally overfished. There's too much pressure on that one species. So what else is out there? In the Irish Sea, we have countless species that you can eat, and it's just that there isn't really a, a commercial need for them as such. There's not um, that many people who eat them, and therefore the pressure stays on these kind of big five species. But there's all kinds of other things you can eat. So there's the flatfish like brill and turbot and dover sole. Um, there's sort of your your swimmery fish <laughs> like coley and pollock and grey mullet. You've got shellfish like clams and mussels, razor clams, cockles. Um, and then you've got shellfish like lobster, crabs and langoustine, which we're um, generally fishing by pots or in the case of langoustine, they're currently trawled, but we're trying to develop a method to fish them by pots. And all of these have different sustainability criteria. We're not saying that you should definitely eat all of them because whether or not a fish is sustainable to eat is quite a complex question and it's one we'll try to address through this talk. But what I just wanted to demonstrate by this slide is that there are so many other things that we can eat in this area um, and which it's really fun adventure to explore how to do that sustainably. So what's stopping us from branching out and moving forward into this magical world of sustainable seafood? Well, I think a big part of it is awareness and understanding. There's a lot of mixed messaging around 
which fishing's good, which fishing's bad, whether fishing at all is ever okay, whether actually it's all a hoax and none of it's true. Um, and obviously that's not what we're saying. But um, I think one of the things that's stopping us kind of moving forward with sustainable fishing is this lack of awareness around what the issues are for marine wildlife and for overfishing and how we can tackle them and still enjoy delicious fish. Another thing that's stopping us is it's quite intimidating looking at a lot of seafood and trying to figure out how to cook it. It's not as simple as some of the things we're used to cooking. Um, but actually when you sort of get into it and, and start learning how to cook some of these things, you realize that it's actually really, really simple, way easier than most meat cooking, way easier than a lot of vegetarian cooking. Um, and is yeah a really easy and healthy thing to cook if you just give it a go. Another issue is local availability. So um, over the past few decades, many of our local fishmongers have closed. The fish counters in supermarkets are smaller. It just becomes harder and harder to actually source that local seafood. And one of the things that we're trying to do through the My Local Catch project is to help develop a bit more of a directory um, for where people can go to find local sustainable seafood, which restaurants use it, which kind of local suppliers use it and how they can find all that kind of information. So that's something we're really hoping to tackle and we're hoping will improve through the course of this project. And then the other thing, as with any sort of sustainability diet or sustainability movement, is there's quite often a perception that it's very high cost and that doing something sustainably means it must be also prohibitively expensive. Um, and I think that's another thing that we're really hoping to tackle in this project because sustainable seafood doesn't mean it has to be expensive. It doesn't mean it has to be inaccessible. Buying locally, buying seasonally um, and, you know, buying the species which are in the area where you're based are actually all great ways to make um, your diet cheaper as well as more sustainable. So we'll go into some more of this as we go through, but those are just a few of the barriers currently. I wanted to just dive a little bit into some of the issues with unsustainable fishing, just to sort of say what it is that we're hoping to sort of um, develop the alternatives to. So lots of the fishing done around the UK is currently done by trawling or dredging, where kind of heavy nets are dragged along the seabed and everything's caught up in it. So you get all kinds of sort of fragile wildlife, plants, different species that you didn't mean to catch, all being caught up in those nets as well as the species that you're trying to catch. And this means that you end up with a lot of waste, you get a lot of habitat destruction and um, you just, it's much less efficient as a system and it's much more damaging for wider marine ecosystems. In terms of the quantity we're fishing, and this comes back to those kind of target species being um, a lot of pressure on them, nearly two thirds of the fish stocks in the UK are overfished and only 38% is managed sustainably. So when we look at kind of what we rely on as a country and how that is stable for the future, there's a lot of uncertainty there and we need to sort of change the way that we're using those resources if we were to think about them as resources to make sure that we're looking after them for the future and then there's the issue which I sort of touched on a little bit but which I'll go into a little bit more where 70% of the fish consumed in the UK is imported and 80% of the fish we catch is exported so there's this real mismatch between what we're catching here versus what we're eating here and if you guys were in my talk last week, you may have already heard me mention this, but I just thought I'd reiterate it um, for the people who are new today. And then finally, we could just write off all seafood. That could be an option. However, by the year 2050, there's going to be 9.7 billion people on the planet. And currently food production, so that's all kinds of agriculture, meat and dairy production, um, sort of plants and fishing, is responsible for 26% of global carbon emissions. And like 
tie into that there's enormous amounts of waste in the food system there's enormous amounts of kind of air miles and other sustainability issues other than just the kind of habitat impacts and the bycatch so if it's done at a small scale if it's done with selective methods like we're going to talk about today then seafood can actually be a really great eco-friendly option so i'll go into a little bit more what the alternative is Sustainable fishing can be a fantastic way of having this great, like healthy, eco-friendly, low carbon, wildlife friendly diet. So the greater the demand for kind of fish caught by sustainable methods, the more chance there is of having areas of the seabed which aren't used for trawling and therefore which are protected from the damage that that causes. Um, so if these static methods like potting for um, crabs and lobster, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, or line catching, hand diving, that kind of thing. If those are the more attractive alternative, then there's more chance that we'll have areas that are kind of safe from trawling. It also means that we can take the pressure off overfish species by choosing local and seasonal catch and therefore protecting those really like high risk species that have a lot of pressure on them. Fishing is also a really, really important part of local culture. And, you know, the UK is an island nation. We really want to make sure that we don't lose that kind of connection with the sea, which throughout our whole history we've had. Um, and protecting local sustainable fishing is a really important way of kind of keeping that heritage for future generations and supporting local businesses in those areas. And then finally, compared to lots of other um, ways of producing food, such as intensive agriculture or meat production, um, seafood can actually be a really, really low carbon way of sourcing your protein. And um, yeah, especially for the people living near to the areas where the fish is caught, it can be a really great part of a low carbon diet. So what should you look for when you're talking about sustainable seafood? there's kind of a lot of different messages around this so we've tried to distill it into a few key points that you can use to help think about whether or not the fish that you'd like to eat is sustainable so the first is how so as i've mentioned and we talked about a lot in the talk last week um methods like trawling and dredging are really damaging for marine habitats and also cause lots of bycatch have lots of waste um, and are generally kind of a difficult one sustainability wise. So static methods, meaning methods where something's kind of either lowered onto the seabed and then stays still, or a line is put down and there's kind of no moving parts dragging along the seabed. These are much better because they won't um, kind of catch lots of other things at the same time. They've got less bycatch. They don't damage the seabed and they also mean that you can choose which fish you take um, from the catch and release the rest unharmed. So you just take the largest ones which have had time to breed and which are going to get a good market price. And by that way, you need to take less in order to feed everybody and support your business and all of the younger ones or the buried females, which is what we call the females when they're carrying their eggs. Um, they're able to be released unharmed back into the sea and can continue supporting a healthy population. Another thing to think about is what is caught and when. So choosing seasonal catch is a really important one because it means you can take advantage of abundance when species are in an area and also avoid periods that might be really sensitive, such as spawning or migration. So there's lots of different ways to kind of find out what species are in season. There's resources like the Good Fish Guide on the Marine Conservation Society's website, um, which will tell you when a good time to buy different fish is. And also this is something that your local fishmonger or your local fisherman is likely to know as well. So it's another reason to kind of buy local because then you know what is in season locally. Another thing to think about is eating low in the food chain. So by this, what I mean is if you eat something like mussels or crabs, what they've been eating is fairly low down in the food chain. It's very often plants or kind of smaller animals. 
and therefore it's much more efficient not a lot of energy has been kind of used in the process of rearing them um, and they're able to be more stable when a system is overfished they're less likely to be impacted by the kind of loss of other species in that system if you compare that to something like tuna is sort of nearly your apex predator it's very high up in the food chain and therefore it needs a lot of other fish in order to support a population of tuna um, for you to then eat so it's just much less efficient as a system a lot more energy is wasted and it has a much higher impact on an ecosystem if you're taking them out and then the other thing you can think about is where you're being it's being taken and how much is being taken so i've said many times that eating what you can locally is fantastic for supporting local businesses and for reducing food miles but also for making sure that we understand where our fish is coming from and what impact it's having directly it's very easy to kind of forget the impact of fishing if it's taking place in the middle of an ocean 2000 miles away so if we really do think about what's happening locally then it's much easier to see that whole journey from kind of fish to fork if you will um the scale of the fishing is also really important. So small scale fisheries means that you're taking fewer fish and you're selling them for a better price. And overall, you need to have much less impact on the whole marine ecosystem in order to um, support your business, feed everyone, etc. So it's much easier to keep your fishing down at kind of a sustainable level where the populations can replenish and you're not damaging the ecosystems. But it's not always fishing as well, which is the best way to do it. Um, aquaculture is something that can be done really sustainably, um, but it can also be done really unsustainably. And this is where it's a whole other topic, which you could read into separately. But things like rope growing mussels up in Scotland or in some places um, such as France and Spain, there's really good sustainable farming for scallops. Um, and yeah, when we're sort of looking at supporting a growing population, aquaculture can be a really good way to produce that fish without resorting to things like trawling or dredging. Um, but it's not always the best method. It can um, be damaging as well. Aquaculture can cause things like um, introduction of invasive species or introduction of excess nutrients to an area because of the feed and the waste from the fish. Um, so that's one where it's really important to use the resources available like the Good Fish Guide um, to read into the areas where it's being farmed and the methods used and to try and make your own decisions there. So that was a lot of information I'm aware, um, but I thought over the next few slides it would be nice to go into just a couple of species which we have in the local area which it's quite easy to find fished by sustainable methods and how you can actually prep and cook that yourself so the first is lobster lobster is gorgeous as i'm sure you're all aware and is a really really great species for sustainability it's one that's had a lot of attention with things like lobster hatcheries and there's kind of a lot of efforts from um you know fishing communities around the country to help um support the replenishment of the stocks there but it's also one which the fishing for it has fairly low impact on um, the surrounding ecosystems because they're fished with static pots which are lowered onto the seabed they're brought up and only the kind of biggest and healthiest um, individuals are taken to be sold the rest are released unharmed as we've discussed and um, it has quite a defined season so um, it doesn't it can't be fished between January and March um, but for the rest of the season, it's fairly abundant. And especially in the summer is the peak season for that. So the way that you'd cook lobster is um, first you cut through the nerve center in the head. And that's because um, it means that they are sort of killed quickly and don't feel any pain. I'm aware that sounds a bit gruesome, but um, it's definitely better than boiling them um, without doing that first. And then you can boil them in salty water or cut and roast them over a barbecue. And a way that we have tried recently, which was really delicious, was sort of cutting them in half, grilling 
the open sides down and then turning them over and putting garlic butter onto them, which all just soaks into all the meat as um, it's cooking and is really delicious. Another species that we have very common locally and which is a really delicious species, which is actually quite undervalued, um, is brown crab or, as you may know, edible crab. They're the ones, if you see the shells, they look like a little pie crust. So they're almost saying, eat me. <laughs> um, they're in season all round. They're most abundant um, throughout the winter. So August to March, um, autumn and winter, I suppose that is. Um, and again, they're fished by potting. So creole pots are lowered onto the seabed. The crabs swim into them and then they're brought up again. So it's a really good one for sustainability because again, there's no bycatch, there's no damage to the seabed and you can choose which individuals you take rather than everything getting swept up. So again, the way that you'd cook that is you boil in water or you can roast them or there's lots of other ways you can try to cook them, but those two are really delicious. In crabs, the nerve center is beneath the egg flap on um, their kind of underbelly. So again, it's really important that you sort of dispatch them before cooking them and there's many a video on YouTube that can show you how to do that if it seems a bit daunting um, and then once you've boiled them a really tasty recipe is to sort of remove the meat and stir it through like a creamy pasta with lemon and butter and a bit of black pepper um, and that's a really delicious meal. Uh, one ethical consideration with crabs is that in some places, I think it's now illegal, but it still occasionally happens, um, you can just buy the crab claws rather than the whole crab. And the issue with this is that it means that the crabs may have been just mutilated and just had the claws, claws cut off and then re-released, um, which is obviously incredibly painful, incredibly damaging. Um, so our advice there is that you always make sure you're buying a full crab, not just the claws. And then just the third one that I'm going to go into, but it's by no means the only seafood in the Irish Sea, um, is sea bass. And the reason I'd like to talk about this one is it's a really good one for being line caught. So you can kind of catch it from the shore. It's a very popular one with sea anglers. Um, or if you're out at sea in a boat, then you can line catch it. And that means that you're not catching anything else by accident. You're only taking um, the individual that you want to keep. Um, and with sea bass, it's quite controlled, which means that the population is protected from overfishing. So individual um, recreational fishers are only allowed to land two sea bass per day. And um, commercial quotas are slightly more than that. But again, it's like really small amounts that you're allowed to get. And therefore, it's quite a good one to know that it's not been overfished if you're getting it from those methods. Um, Again, it has a fairly defined season, so it's sort of through the summer and early autumn is when um, you're best to get sea bass. And the way that it's cooked definitely reflects that it's really nice with like salads or like light pasta things or like fried with a bit of Mediterranean veg. And it's definitely a really like nice, light, summery um, fish to cook. Um, it's very easy to cook you can almost always get a fishmonger to have already filleted it or if you're having to descale it yourself it's really simple you just like get some gloves and scrape all the scales off in the wrong direction um there's many a video on youtube about how to kind of fill it and prepare the sea bass if you're doing the whole thing yourself but again a fishmonger will almost always do that for you and you can just buy them as the fillets you fry it the white side down um first for a few minutes and then just at the end you flip it over to the other side and fry the skin side as well in a little bit of oil loads of butter a bit of salt and pepper and it's really really delicious um just a, a note on sea bass something to be aware of it can be trawled and it is also sometimes farmed and um the sustainability of those farming methods really varies on the area and the regulations so it's really important to check with your fishmonger how it was caught. And if it is um, trawled, it's probably best to avoid it or to read more into how it's been done because it has historically been really overfished in lots of areas, especially in like Southern Europe. 
Um, and if it's been farmed, it's important to kind of read into whether it's got any sort of farming, sustainable agriculture certification or that kind of thing. Um, but the message throughout this is that fishmongers know absolutely everything and you can talk to them about it and they will know where it's come from and, and how it's been sourced and all that kind of thing. So speaking of fishmongers, where can you go to get this seafood? So um, Cumbria and, you know, North and West Cumbria has kind of lost a lot of its um, fishmongers in recent years, but we have still got some and they're brilliant. Um, so West Coast Fish is based in Workington and Fine Fish is based in Cockermouth. And if you go into either of those, the guys who run it know everything there is to know about seafood, about how to prepare it, about where it's come from. Um, and you can even do things like sushi courses and, you know, kind of extra things to learn about um, what's going on there. Um, obviously, the fishmongers, they sell all different types of fish. So just because it's from a fishmonger, it doesn't mean it is sustainable, but they will know things about where it's come from. So you can talk to them about how it was caught. You can ask about those sustainable methods like creeling and hand diving and line catching. Um, and they'll be able to really help you out and they know their product really well. Another um, company to, that's worth checking out if you're not in Workington or Cockermouth or driving distance of those is M&J Seafood. That's an online um, fishmonger and they're, again, really good at having all the sustainability information with everything they're selling. Um, so you can kind of give a bit of a read into it and be confident that what you're buying um, is sustainably caught. And these are just examples. There's loads of other fishmongers in the Fleetwood area, in Morecambe, um, in Barrow. And um, yeah, it's absolutely worth going to your local fishmonger and supporting them whilst they're there. So oh, that's the kind of general Cumbria seafood part. Um, so I suppose it's probably worth introducing what we're doing in um, Cumbria Wildlife Trust. So, missed a slide there. As I mentioned at the start, there's two joint projects. Um, the first is the Cumbrian Creel Project, which is helping local fishermen to develop sustainable fishing for langoustine as a kind of beautiful Cumbrian cuisine. Langoustine is one of the most commonly fished species in the Irish Sea. It's one of our really important like British staples, but it's hardly ever eaten here. Um, and also the bottom trawling methods for it are very damaging. So we're helping to develop um, sustainable creole fishing and then helping them to develop kind of the supply chain and their sustainable business side of that. So I'll just start with a little video. Those of you who were here last week will have already seen this video, but it's just a couple of minutes explaining what the Cumbrian Creole Project's about and um, what it's aiming to do. And then I'll go on to explain a bit more about my local catch. Now, it's worth saying with this video that it's very quiet. So it's worth turning your volume up now and I'll talk very quietly. And then after the video, you can turn it down again. You're looking into the future and if I can catch and return fish at the same The Creel Project is a, a project that we've been wanting to do for a long time. Something that we feel is really important because not only are our seas, the important species and habitats that live there being threatened by unsustainable fisheries, but also the livelihoods of coastal fishermen are being threatened because of declines in you know, fish populations and also rising fuel prices and things like that. And the Creel Project is a really great example of how fisheries and conservationists can work together for mutual benefit. A sustainable fishery is a fishery where you're, you're thinking about what you're catching, how much you're catching and how you're doing it. So we're trying to only catch what we need, catch larger individuals that have had a chance to, to breed and reproduce and to catch it in a, a low impact way so we're not damaging the habitats and the other species that live in that area. So when trawlers go out, the nets go in and they sink to the seabed and often multiple nets drag across the seabed, sweeping up everything in their path. But when we use creel pots, they sink to the seabed fairly slowly and they just rest on the surface. 
So we're working with small scale coastal fishermen in Barrow and Furness and Whitehaven to undertake a project to look at the feasibility of creel fishing for longestines on a commercial scale. And we've been able to show that it does work and we've been able to catch large, high quality prawns that would have a high market value. So now we're looking to develop this project and test it on a, a wider scale. And we're also hoping to work with the local communities to help them understand what's out there in the Irish Sea and what their local catch is. The sustainable fishery is very important because obviously you're looking into the future and if I can catch and return fish at the same time, obviously in the long run it's going to, we're going to benefit, benefit from it. Dolphins, seals, there's all kinds of life. In the pots you get all different types of species like wrasse, lobsters now and again, whelks, you get all different, different types of fish. It's amazing what, what life is out there. The benefits of my catch, with me being a day boat, it's fresh and you can't really, you can't beat that. Obviously my catch is as fresh as possible. It obviously demands, a, in my eyes, it, de it demands the top, top money for the produce I'm supplying. I'd say the perfect day would be when you get up, mid middle of the summer, you come down, there's not a ripple on the water, and then you head out and you just plod away all day. Whether you catch fish or you don't catch fish, it's just a bonus, it's nice to be out. down again so that I don't deafen you. I'll just give everyone 10 seconds to do that. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so that was the Cumbrian Creole project, which we focused a lot on last week. And what I'd like to do now is talk a bit about my local catch and how the community engagement side of that is helping to support the, the development of the sustainable fishing methods. So a really important element in this whole process is the local fishermen. Um, my local catch is helping those fishermen to kind of develop the supply chains for their catch, um, to use it in local food festivals and local kind of traders markets and just help raise awareness about that product and how fantastic and delicious and sustainable it is and how people can support those fishermen in the work they're doing. It'll also have lots of knowledge sharing events to spread the word about this sustainable fishing method and its benefits to the wider fishing community. So through the project itself, we're working with three fishermen to really kind of have focused support for them. Um, but the idea is that we'll be able to take the findings from the project and share it with the wider fishing community and help um, them to have a go at this fishing method themselves and hopefully make it a part of their business and diversify away from destructive methods. Um, we're also doing a lot of work with schools and with youth groups, um, both some primary and lots of kind of secondary school events. Um, so this is a combination of workshops raising awareness about sustainable seafood, um, cooking classes, helping to like teach kids how to cook themselves and help, you know, look after themselves. It's careers classes, helping um, young people to explore both careers in conservation and in sustainable fishing and help keep that kind of local workforce in Cumbria fighting for our future of our marine ecosystems. Um, and it's also just all kinds of activities helping people to access the coast and to engage with the wildlife there and therefore to care about that environment because it's really difficult to um, see the importance of something if it's not something you're connected with. So connection with the coast is a really important part of that work as well. We're working with restaurants and suppliers to help them to um, you know, understand what this product is, how to market it, how it can be a real um, appeal for them. We've had suppliers tell us in the past that um, langoustine is a really difficult um, product to sell because of this um, perception that it's always unsustainable because it's usually trawled. Um, so helping them to kind of offer this sustainable way of having langoustine for their customers is a really great benefit. And through that, we'll also be doing things like getting um, 
sample menus from some of our fantastic local chefs from various restaurants um, to have kind of special ways that you can cook all these different um, catch so that you can try it for yourself. We're doing lots of community events. So the two weeks that we're in at the moment is all about um, community events throughout West Cumbria. Um, hopefully some of you were with us at Seafest on Saturday. That was a really great success. That's what this photo here is from. And we gave out lots of delicious seafood tasters there of lobster and sea bass and langoustine. Um, but there'll be all kinds of events like that throughout the whole project, including um, engagement events, helping people access the coast, masterclasses of different kind of cooking things um, and just all kinds of different activities that people can get involved in. Um, there's lots of different events we're doing revolving around tasters and cooking demos and helping teach people how to cook these things themselves. So we'll be attending local food festivals We'll be running kind of online masterclasses, but then also running in-person masterclasses. And that's something um, to kind of develop through the project as we hear what it is that people want. So if there's something that you think you need to help you access sustainable seafood, then absolutely let us know and we can try and incorporate that into our program in West Cumbria. And then um, all this work, the kind of overarching theme of everything is marine awareness. So anything that we can do to help people understand the wildlife in the area, understand how the things that they do impact that wildlife and how sustainable fishing can help protect it is always really important. So just before we finish, I wanted to flag a couple of upcoming events which you might want to um, check out. So Taste of the Sea is an event coming up in Maryport in two weeks time. And that is um, a food festival just like Taste Cumbria. In fact, it's kind of run as a sub part of Taste Cumbria, but it's all focused on seafood. And we'll be there with a fantastic demonstration chef talking about sustainable seafood and giving out tasters of creole caught langoustine from our fishermen in Barrow. And um, we might even have a sort of touch tank where you can see some langoustine for, you, for yourself but it won't be the same ones we're eating don't worry um taste cumbria is the sort of big sister of that event and we'll be there in september again doing demonstrations talking to people about sustainable seafood and promoting that product and then throughout the next year we'll be doing master classes with different local chefs and providers and helping people to understand how to do all this for themselves at home so if you'd like to find out more about any of these projects, there's loads of information on the Living Seas Northwest website. Um, there's the Cumbrian Creel Project, which is the fishing side of this. And then there's My Local Catch, which is the community engagement side, as I mentioned. You can also follow Living Seas Northwest on social media um, and look for our Fishy Friday posts, which are the ones focused on the My Local Catch project, but also all of our events in West Cumbria, um, a link to this project and we'll have information um, available. And then, of course, you can come to any of our events. So the events are hosted through the Cumbria Wildlife Trust website's event page, and you can go in there and search My Local Catch as an event type, and that will let you get through to um, all the, all the um, events which are linked to this project. So I think that's all my slides for today. I can see there's some wonderful questions coming in, so I'll go to a few of those now. Beth, could could you give me find me some questions? Yes. Um. So the first one was: Are our local celebrity chefs like Simon Rogan interested in these catches? That was from Jane. Yes. Hi, Jane. So we've already been in touch with a few local celebrity chefs. So we're working with John Crouch, who is um a local demonstration chef and Aladell counsellor, <laughs> um, and he's going to be working with us at Taste of the Sea. We're also collaborating with Peter Sidwell and with Ben Wilkinson on various things linked to Taste Cumbria. Um, and we're kind of actively 
seeking those kind of demonstration chefs to help us run events or to help us with our awareness raising work um so if there's anyone that you think would be interested and that you have contact details for absolutely send them my way um you can find my contact details on the my local catch website um web page and i would love to hear from anyone else you think might be interested because that's absolutely the kind of thing that we're looking to do question so are booths supermarkets buying local and sustainable do you know um it's really difficult to sort of generalize at a whole supermarket because there's many different definitions of sustainable and responsibly sourced um booths are certainly one who do put quite a lot of work into thinking about it um but i couldn't say as a blanket whether everything they sell is sustainable because there's so many questions about food miles, about the different farming impacts, about fishing methods, um, about, you know, whether things are in season. Um, but I would say because um, Booth's quite often has a fish counter, you'd be able to talk to the people working there about everything that's on that counter and how it's been caught and where it's from. And you'd be able to get that kind of information from them directly. But I can't say that as a blanket, it's all sustainable. reliably sustainable and ethical i've not actually heard of fish forever nikki so i'm going to make a note of that and i will send out a response saying whether fish forever are um i've not heard of them as a business but in terms of tin fish you can look for the marine stewardship council um label which is sort of better than not having it it's not the be all and end all um, and there's also kind of other cert certifications about whether it's kind of, you know, dolphin friendly and reducing bycatch and that kind of thing. Um, but those kind of certifications, because they're on such a large scale, um, it's very difficult to say whether it's always reliable. Um, so we think that buying locally so that you kind of know where it's coming from and know it's coming from those small scale places is a much more dependable way to kind of know the impact that the fish is having and know that it's manageable. I see you've just kind of answered this question from Rod, but he was asking which certification schemes are reliable, really reliable for sustainability. So you mentioned the MSC one, are there any others that? Yeah, so with all of those certifications, it's sort of better to have it than not to have it. So if you're going to buy tinned tuna, then it's better to buy one with a label than to buy one without a label because they do do a lot of work to kind of make fisheries more sustainable. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are reliably, absolutely sustainable. There's still a lot of issues with large scale industrial fishing as a whole, regardless of what badge they have. So, yeah, as I said, if you can try and buy local and sort of small scale places, then it's much more likely that it's sustainable source um and polly wants to know if there are going to be any online events yes <laughs> <laughs> so um we've done these two webinars over the last two weeks as i mentioned the master classes um are likely to have some of them online as well so that we can have a bit of a wider reach and people who aren't based in west cumbria can come so there's likely to be some kind of cook along webinar demonstration type things um and if there's anything in particular you'd like from an online event then again drop me an email request things i'm really open to ideas of how we can expand the reach of this project and yeah i definitely love to use the online medium as much as we can um that's all the questions we've had so far so if anyone wants to ask any more just pop them in the chat um i was going to ask actually you mentioned sort of buying food that's sort of low down from the food chain yeah is there much scope for um seaweed farming in the irish sea do you know much about that i don't actually know about seaweed farming here specifically um i know it's done a lot up in scotland and there's lots of research into what's called kind of multi-trophic farming which is where say you have a salmon farm then in the same area you can have a shellfish farm and a seaweed farm and by kind of creating that whole ecosystem, you're recycling all the nutrients much better. And it's kind of the 
fish themselves are much healthier and it has less impact on the whole ecosystem so like there's definitely potential for it i don't know if it's being done in the irish sea if it is being done in the irish sea i don't know what the sustainability is of it because obviously there's still the factor of aquaculture is taking away space from other habitats and wildlife um, but it's definitely something to look into and I'll research it a bit more. Um, in terms of the fish we can eat, no. Um, there have been extensive studies by the Environment Agency into the impact um, that Bellafield has on the habitats. And um, there's been no evidence to say that the fish... Um, or the plants in that area aren't perfectly safe to eat. I think the levels of radiation are so low um, that it's just not a big issue. I think where it could be an issue is with kind of foraging shellfish. I don't know if it's safe to do that along sections of the Cumbrian coast, either from previous chemical pollution or from the possibility for radioactive things um but certainly any of the fish that's being like caught and sold commercially has passed lots of safety regulations and is perfectly fine question are there any other other sustainable fishing schemes you've talked to that have been successful um with changing their practices i was watching fishermen with krills yesterday from scotland <laughs> Oh, brilliant. That sounds great. I'm a big fan of Fishman with Creels up in Scotland. <laughs> um, in terms of changing the practices, there was places that we talked about last week in the webinar where sort of trawls ban like trawling bands were introduced in an area and people had to switch to creel potting. And then it's all about kind of managing the intensity of the potting to make sure it's still sustainable. Um, the potting, which we're doing for langoustine, has been done for many, many years up in the sea lochs in Scotland. And the kind of big difference here, the big change was whether or not it would still work in the open waters of the Irish Sea, because it's much more turbulent. And they thought that the creel pots might get kind of all like churned up and it wouldn't work. But the pilot project in 2019 shows that it does work. It works really well. You get exactly the same kind of captures as you're getting up in Scotland. Um, and it's really good. So yeah, there have been sort of successful use of this method in other places, and it's just about applying it to the, the new challenges of the open water in the Irish Sea. Hard to say far. Just a, a comment on polys. I think the price is higher because it's smaller scale. That is absolutely right. It's also because the actual catch you're getting is higher quality. So when you trawl for fish, you kind of get everything. Um, including the ones that are undersize or which have been kind of smashed up by the trawlers. Um, so when you're catching in creel pots, because all you're bringing in is like the big healthy ones and you're bringing them in live so you can sell them live, it's just kind of a higher quality product and therefore you can sell it for more. Um, so the scale is definitely a part of it, but it's also the kind of quality of what you're selling. got a couple more minutes so if anyone has any questions then do put them in um but if you don't then thank you so much for joining it was absolutely lovely to spend an evening with you all today um and i really hope that that gave you a little bit of inspiration um for going out and cooking some sustainable seafood yourself it's so easy to do so delicious so healthy so environmentally friendly if you source it in the right way and i really couldn't recommend it enough as um a fun thing to go and try for yourself I think that's probably all our questions. So I shall bid you farewell. Thank you very much for joining and thank you Beth for helping me. <laughs>